is the DeFi Decoded Podcast by Nine Point Partners. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be taken as investment advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before investing. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of DeFi Decoded. I am Alex Tapscott. Last week, Andrew and I spoke about some of the key takeaways from the consensus conference in Austin. And chief among those was opinions about the current regulatory environment, both in the United States and around the world. There was a sense from conference attendees that the US appeared to be closing itself off to the industry, just as other parts of the world might be opening up, or at least trying to wrestle with this new technology markets in places like Hong Kong, the UAE, Singapore, and even Europe, uh, hardly known for being a trailblazer in um, entrepreneurship or in technology, at least not recently, has created a framework that puts what the US has done to shame so far. Um, We tried to talk a little bit about it on last week's show, but we we also know the limits of our own knowledge. And so that's why I'm really fortunate today to be joined by an expert a guest and friend, Sheila Warren, who is the CEO of the Crypto Council for Innovation, which is the premier global alliance for advancing the promise of this new technology through research, education, and advocacy. Sheila is a Harvard-trained lawyer and began her career as an attorney at Cravath, Swain, and Moore. She spent significant time also as a lawyer and executive in the not-for-profit sector, helping companies work with emerging technology to solve problems, and increase efficiency. She was on the leadership team at TechSoup and built NGO Source, an online service that helps US foundations reduce costs on cross-border grants. Later, she went on to found the blockchain division at the World Economic Forum and regularly briefed heads of state, ministers, and CEOs from the Fortune 100 on global trends, policy, and new advances. She was a member of the forum's executive committee and oversaw tech strategy across 14 countries. In addition to her current role as CEO, Sheila is the co-host of Coindesk's leading podcast, Money Reimagined, alongside former Wall Street Journal editor Michael Casey. She's spoken around the world at events such as the Milken Institute, South by Southwest, the Skoll World Forum Consensus, and many, many others. She is also on the board of the ACLU, Northern California, an overseas development institute. Okay, Sheila, so you're the right person for this conversation. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me. So before we dive into these big issues, tell us a little bit about your journey into Web3. Sure. So uh, as you, in that very kind bio, as you noted, um, I spent um, about a decade in civic technology. And at TechSoup, I built a a SaaS product that was designed to help streamline diligence needed to move money across borders in the charitable context, charitable donative dollars. Um, And then I was general counsel at a place called TechSoup. And so I actually came to this technology through the lens of data not through the lens of financial services, funnily enough, despite my knowledge about cross-border money and how hard it is to do, really hard, especially at small dollar value, hard it is to get money across the border. Um, But I became very concerned about sensitive information we had on civil society organizations, that if it fell in the hands of the wrong actors, in this case, uh, the government, uh, would put lives at risk. And uh, when I was wrestling with this question with our CTO, uh, a friend asked me if I'd heard of the blockchain. I had not heard of the blockchain. And he said, have you heard of Bitcoin? And I said, it wasn't that, that like internet money that, you know, I don't know, whatever, dark web, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, you know, the technology is really what you ought to be thinking about when it comes to a new way of storing, using, uh, and safeguarding really data and information. So that was my hook into it. It really is kind of what we now call this Web3 frame. Yeah. Uh, over the course of time, you know, I got really interested in, uh, this is the early days of Ethereum and what you could do with ERC-20 tokens, what you couldn't do, the limits. And then just became really interested and engaged with all the different myriad ways and use cases that emerged and have emerged and are continuing to emerge from that. Terrific. So um, before the Crypto Council for Innovation, you were spearheading a blockchain at the World Economic Forum. So I think a lot of people are really quite curious about the World Economic Forum and what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, I think most people associate it with the big Davos event that takes place in January, but um, it is an organization that's running 24-7, 365 and doing all sorts of stuff. So what was the objective there when you um, started to spearhead that group? Yeah, so I was a a founding uh, staff member of something that's called the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, 
uh, which I know you're familiar with. And the idea there was that we're seeing this new digital revolution that is being fueled by you know, blockchain and AI and these different kinds of technologies uh, that is more peer-to-peer, -peer, it's more democratic, but it is kind of a, a really a revolution uh, that we haven't seen since personal computing. And so the idea of the center, which eventually stood up um, locations in 16 different countries, um, which were ultimately all under me before I left the forum, was, you know, regulation and policy are never going to pace technology because tech is just really fast. Yeah. But surely there are ways of reimagining the regulatory, regulatory and policy environment that will actually allow a more flexible regulatory model that can accommodate innovation while still safeguarding users. Yeah. And that was the idea, was to think about, are there different models and mechanisms for policymaking as a field, essentially, that could be helpful here? Uh, we also felt it was our job as a convener to bring together a variety of different actors. So we had everything from startups, civil society, uh, academics, you know, heads of big governments, all of these actors together to talk about the new risks and opportunities that various technologies brought to the table. So in my case, I founded the Blockchain Digital Assets team. And let all the you know the um, activities that we happen to hire the team, created the strategy, and all of that. By the time I left, I was overseeing the entire center. That's terrific. And is that center still? Uh, is that well? I know the fourth industrial revolution um, is still a core theme at the World Economic Forum. Is the um, blockchain center that you helped to stand up still running? And is it still? Yeah. Running? So yeah. great question. So as things have shifted and evolved, these technologies have made way for other new technologies that have come into play. So whether it's, you know, the metaverse, uh, whether it's di a different focus on AI, you know, other kinds of things. And some of the technologies as more and more constituents and stakeholders familiar with technologies got embedded into the forum's communities, that's now shifted a bit. So there's blockchain projects that are happening and crypto projects across the rest of the forum. From what I understand, the forum just underwent a massive reorganization. I'm frankly have not caught up yet to know exactly what that looks like. Um, but I believe that there are a variety of different centers now that are thematic in focus. There's always been a big focus on nature and climate and geography and things like that, obviously yeah. politics. Um, but yeah, so I'd say that this stuff has become, these topics have become a little more uh, pervasive and embedded throughout the entire uh, forum rather than having a specific focal point and focus area. And that's in part a reflection of the fact they're not as new as they were, you know, five, six years ago. Yeah. Got it. Okay, enough about the forum. Um, tell us about the Crypto, Crypto Council for Innovation. So you're, you've been the CEO now, I think for, is it two years? Um, no, no, uh, February of last year. So oh, year God. Of, yeah, well, not very that's long. Like, that's like, <laughs> well, that's, you know, it's 15, 16 months. So that's, yeah. that's, that's 20 years in, in uh, crypto. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Years. That's true. Um, <laughs> whole lifetime in crypto years. So research, education, and advocacy, I can't think of three more important things. Um, but what's the day to day look like for you? Yeah, well, so I am the CEO of a small business, and I think there's important to recognize that, you know, CEOs have a lot of responsibilities that maybe you're not the sexiest thing, but keeping the lights on, keeping things running, you know, we are a membership model. So making sure we understand um, what is happening out in the space and we're at the cutting edge of the innovation and the technology, but we are a policy and education shop. So we really are here to break this stuff down, kind of what I've been doing for the last, you know, number of years at the forum, um, but focused on this topic. So we engage with policymakers, uh, whether it's politicians, regulators, others. We do a lot of narrative um, around this area to really educate the public as well about what's actually happening. What are the, how do we get beyond the kind of media hype cycle or either way, whether it's like overly hyped or, you know, overly criticized. I think both those things tend to happen. It's a bit of a pendulum. Um, and really our goal is to ensure that there's forward thinking regulation and policy that comes into place that is going to, similarly to my last gig, and I've brought some of that mindset over, that's going to further innovation and allow for a wide aperture of innovation while also being responsible about consumer use and making sure that we are not creating a, you know, an environment where scammers and fraudsters can thrive because that is something that's happened in crypto. But we're right. also acknowledging that you know some amount of speculative activity, some amount of failure, frankly, is inevitable in anything that is new and innovative. And we have to accommodate that as well and know the difference between a bad actor and an actor that maybe is not just well-intentioned, but whose model just doesn't succeed for ordinary reasons. That That's a very good point. And it goes back to the, to the earlier point about um, how regulation ca can't keep up with technology. Uh, and at the same time, government or rather business can't really succeed in, in an environment where there's no regulation at all or no rules of the road. Now, obviously, an industry can begin to thrive and can grow and can 
test um, you know, the limits of what it can do. And I think that's what we've seen the past little while. But if we expect big enterprises and uh, big allocators of capital to continue to invest into this space, they need to know that what they're investing in is um, clearly defined or as you know, uh, above board or that you know, when, when, when Starbucks launches a loyalty program or when Nike you know, gets an NFTs, that it's not inadvertently running afoul of securities laws. Now, in those two instances, those companies actually have moved ahead regardless. So clearly they feel comfortable, but there is a great deal of, of uncertainty. Um, and you know, so far, at least what we've seen is uh, regulation by enforcement. And part of that has to do with the personalities and the regulators. But, but I think a big part of it has to do that there actually has not been um, any new sort of comprehensive framework for, for, for crypto and Web3. Now, I interviewed you uh, for my upcoming book in October of last year. That happened to be one month before FTX collapsed. And so I'm right. guessing it's a perhaps- Oh, wow, that's, that, that timing is nuts. <laughs> I know, right? But you know, in that discussion, you told me that that uh, this industry is one of the one of the few in DC that has um, you know a rare kind of like bipartisan um, support, right? Whether it's in Congress or or, or what have you, um, does that <laughs> does that cross does that bipartisan consensus exist still, or has it kind of been blown to bits in the in the wake of of FTX? And what what is your view on you know any any laws, any good laws being passed to advance the industry in an appropriate way. Yeah, so there's a lot in there. Uh, Sorry, but let me kind of, start by, yeah, I no, no worries. Let me, <laughs> not a problem, these are meaty topics. Let me yeah. start by saying, you know, uh, I think that right now uh, in our world and especially in Washington, everything is political. Everything is political and, and crypto is not immune to that. Now, that being said, I still think that there are folks who are, you know, champions, whatever it is, who really understand the potential and what we're talking about here, our digital future on both sides of the aisle. And I actually think even calling people Democrats and Republicans anymore is kind of like played out. Like there's so many different subgroups, you know, in those categories, right? Uh, I think we've got folks from all across the political spectrum, leaving aside party affiliation, who uh, are do understand, you know, what's at stake here. I think some of those folks care about this because they tend to be uh, supporters of technology as a general matter. And yeah. some people tend to be for it because they, they're they concerned about national security implications of it. Yeah. Uh, some, I think, are concerned about you know, jobs, employment, all these kinds of things. Some are worried about monopolies, right? And they want to see a more decentralized architecture of the internet. So for a variety of very different reasons, there are a number of folks who are you know quite educated on our topics, who understand this industry and the technology, who are not naive about the challenges, but also really understand you know what is at stake here. So, uh, and that remains true. What's changed, I think most of those people haven't actually changed. What has changed is that folks who were kind of neutral or skeptical slightly have now leaned into being pretty anti uh, this right. space. And that I think is largely political. I don't think it's because any like new information has come to light and suddenly, you know, things have shifted. I do think that Sam Bankman Freed and his kind of like spreading money all around Washington did not help matters for sure. But I think most people recognize that Sam, that whole situation, allegedly, I suppose I should say, was, you know, sort of old school fraud, right? I mean, like it wasn't like, it had nothing to do with the blockchain or with, you know, any of that stuff. So you're seeing a lot of people start to make these kind of bizarre divisions where they're like, well, blockchain technology is great, but, you know, crypto assets are terrible. And you're like, well, what about other kinds of tokens, right? There's like utility tokens. There's all kinds of different things that go in here. And when you think about the incentive structure and governance in a crypto ecosystem, as you well know, Alex, you're talking about some kind of tokenization and token model. So people are great with fractionized real estate, but they think Bitcoin is like evil. So it's kind of like really interesting, right? Because these yeah. distinctions, when you kind of push on them, there's some arguments that could stand up, but a lot of them don't really hold up. So that I think is what shifted. It's not that the allies, the supporters, the people who understand this, who are willing to learn have shifted. It's that we now have some folks that are that, that are making political points, I think, by being very loud against yeah. this opportunity. Or using, yeah, or the ones who were negative to begin with, uh, using, a you know, never letting a good- case. Turning that up. That's right. That's right. Exactly. I think that's exactly right. The other thing I'll say, because your other question was about, you know, legislation, are we going to get legislation this year? And look, I mean, yeah. I will tell you from talking to a lot of these folks- I think there's actually enough consensus, ha ha ha, consensus, right? But um, um, to actually get to uh, a bill. I, I think there's enough agreement on some of the core principles here. But the pol you can't ignore the politics. The politics are very, very complicated here. 
So, I mean, I look no further than the fact that it took, you know, what was it, 15, 16 something votes to get a Speaker of the House elected, right? That's something that normally is like, just snap your fingers and it's done. It's not even like, it's just, it's a blip on the, you know, in the time scale of, of, of the House. And so we're in a world where, and that wasn't because Democrats were holding it up, right? I and mean, there's within the Republican Party there, right? So, so all of this politics is going to play into any legislation that tries to move. And it is an extraordinarily complicated time to try to get anything passed, let alone something that does carry a degree of controversy, whether that's fair or unfair. So that's where we are. That's where we're. That's where we are. So going back to the the Crypto Council for Innovation, you you said you're you're doing education and advocacy, and you're talking to lawmakers. Are you lobbying on behalf of the industry? Like, where does the funding for the organization come from? Yeah, great question. So we do have a number of lobbyists. We have lobbyists that are outside lobbyists, and we have a couple of in house lobbyists. Um, and that is because in Washington, in order to have certain kinds of conversations, if you work with industry, you need their rules around what you're allowed to do. Now, it's pretty hilarious in some ways when you look at, you know, Sam was following a lot of those rules and yet here we are, right? Nevertheless, yeah, exactly. that is, that's how it works. Um, in Europe, you know, there's not, like, the lobbying concept is not really part of the environment. So there, I'd say what we do is really just ordinary education, but we try to make a lot of connections. We try to connect uh, lawmakers who are open to learning about this industry and technology to te technical folks, uh, to folks who've been in the space for a long time. We try to get them educated about the future of the technology, where it's going, and what's actually happening. Um, and the reason for that is right now, you know, there's not a lot of bills that are coming up. Right? I mean, there's like some bills that are in motion and here and there, and some that have been introduced and some that haven't been. Um, but our goal, again, is to get a solid regulatory framework around this activity so that we can move forward in a healthy way that, again, promotes innovation and protects consumers. And to do that in the United States, you do have to engage in some amount of lobbying activity as well. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's like as American as apple pie. It's the nature, that's right. It's the nature <laughs> of what it is. But I have to say, I didn't know a ton about, you know, because I didn't I've done a lot of this kind of conversation in Europe and in all over Asia, you know, Australia with the Australians, South America, even in Africa. I hadn't done a lot of this in Washington. So it's been a very interesting learning experience for me working with people who are career lobbyists and who understand how this all works. And, and uh, you know, it's it's relatively straightforward, but it's also, it's a very interesting, very interesting. <laughs> I put it that way, how this works. So another big event that's happened this year, which has got nothing to do with crypto, but has had knock-on effects is the collapse in the regional banking system. Right. Specifically at the outset of the crisis, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and Silvergate, which had businesses that were diversified, but were also big you know, banks for the crypto industry. And um, there are varying perspectives on how crypto fits into this story, right? Um, I think that everyone is the star of their own narrative. And so I think a lot of people would like to think somehow that the, the banking crisis revolved around crypto. Um, when in fact, it's probably more complex. But basically, I think I, I could break it into sort of two categories. Category number one would be what I would call the operation choke point category. And those are people who believe that for the past six months, there's been an organized, concerted effort at various levels of government, both in the administrative state, Congress, regulators, et cetera, to like take down the industry. And then there's the other side, which is, um, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, you know, with the collapse of these banks, it was an opportunity for naysayers to highlight things that they've long been promoting and um, to use this as evidence that somehow, you know, the exposure to crypto is what helped to fuel the crisis or, you know, that the fact that these banks were going into um, government control meant that they could be severed from the industry. Which of those two categories do you find yourself in, or or neither? If you have a different perspective, I'd be happy to. to I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I'm I'm probably more neither actually. Uh, yeah. I, I think there is no. Okay, so let's just back up. So a couple of things I just think are important to log. One is I don't think anybody who is credible, period, thinks that Silicon Valley Bank and it's the situation had anything to do with crypto. Yeah. And even some of crypto's biggest detractors and skeptics have pretty much acknowledged that. That's just, that was just a whole different thing. Yeah. I live in Silicon Valley and near Silicon Valley. And I know, you know, people who bank at Silicon Valley Bank and it is the local taqueria. It's the dry cleaner. It's the, you know, it's chair, it's charities and philanthropies. It's schools. It's, I mean, it's a variety of different, it's a regional bank. Yeah. So uh, it banked a lot of startups, 
I think there was some investigation as to whether the number of startups that it banked, uh, meaning small businesses, right? Startup is fundamentally a small business and there's some risk inherent in starting a small business. Sure. Whether that contributed to this, but then ultimately that wasn't what it was about at all. It was about mismanagement of balance sheets. It was all about all, all other kinds of liquidity risk, all kinds of other things. And that I just want to carve that out because that's just not a conversation. And it, I think we should just like, kill that narrative. The same thing is true of Signature. Uh, and the reason we know that is because the chair, the head of the DFS, who was the regulator that oversaw Signature Bank, has testified in front of Congress saying nothing to do with crypto. I don't know a person who is more qualified to make that assessment than Adrian Harris, and she herself yeah. has said it. And there's no, I don't, again, I don't think anybody credible is claiming that she is either, either she'd have to be lying or wrong, or I don't know what, and that just seems also bananas. So I just think it's really important to land that those two, nothing to do with crypto whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And the third, of course, is Silvergate. Uh, I actually was, you know, more open to the idea that Silvergate might be related to crypto, in part because it was the first one. But as you push on that, exact same thing, not related. Had a whole bunch of other real estate, holdings, other kinds of things. Um, this was just fundamentally about, you know, mismanagement, big bets, liquidity, inflation, all kinds of other things. Okay. So I think we have to just land the actual facts of what happened here, which is this banking crisis has absolutely nothing to do with crypto. Got it. Okay. That's number one. So that puts, and when you, and again, if you know, don't take my word for it, you can take Adrian Harris's word for it. You can take anybody in Silicon Valley Bank's word for it who's, who's engaged with that process. Silvergate, this is very well documented at this point in time. Now, all that being said, that pushes me into arguably, you could say your second option, which is, well, this happened. Why not try to throw the blame at crypto yeah. industry? And the fact that that was even a conversation when it was, there's just zero evidence that that's the case would seem to suggest that, huh, that second option that you put out there, there here's a crisis. We don't like crypto. Let's take advantage of it and kind of like try to squeeze out crypto could be true. And I have some empathy for that position because I think that the circumstantial evidence is pretty damning here. And yeah. the fact that you know banks are actively de-risking crypto companies, meaning they're putting them through really extensive hoops in order to become to get basic banking services is really challenging. And that is definitely happening. Like I can tell you that is definitely, I can confirm that is absolutely happening. There's no question about it. Why that's happening is an interesting question. And without, there's no smoking gun here, without getting access to confidential supervisory information, which when a bank regulator goes in and has a conversation with a bank that it supervises, supervisors at the supervisor level, without getting access to that, we don't really know. Are these can regulators going in be, and telling people- Can that information be um, obtained through like a freedom of information request? It can't be gone through FOIA. It's only through congressional act. Okay. Congress can request it, right? So FOIAs are just going to show you what's available. And, I, and I'm not of a mind that thinks the FOIA is going to turn up anything useful in this, this space. Useful being something that would kind of be this evidence that banking regulators are going in and telling banks not to bank crypto. Now, yeah, exactly. all that being said, we have to remember, what does banking crypto mean? Okay. What it means is fiat money, like anybody else that's being used to pay payroll, make payroll, pay taxes, pay a vendor you know, pay a lease, like it's cash, yep. right? These banks were not, and, and banks are not banking tokens. That's not what they're holding. They're holding US dollars or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is seeing how many foreign banks are eager to bank crypto companies because they understand that it's just another method of getting deposits. It's, yep. just, it's just cash money, right? So the idea that a crypto company is more risky because of the activity it's engaging in versus things like how solvent is it? You know, what's its reserve? What's it hold? What does the team like? All all of these other kinds of things. It could you could have a highly collateralized crypto company and a very risky laundromat, right? It's all a matter that business might fail, but you have to kind of think about what is it that the banking activity is actually for and what is it doing. So the idea right. that this is inherently more risky is just kind of bizarre. It doesn't really make sense. Okay, yeah. so that's one thing. Now I think I'm when I say I'm kind of of a third mindset. I think that it's kind of a hybrid. I think there are some people, but I think there are very few and far between who have had it, you know, had it in or had it out or whatever for crypto for some time. I think that is true. Um, but I also think that now I know in Washington the way that I do, the idea that all these folks are like sitting around in a room and like, you know, that's, I just, I don't buy into conspiracy theories as a general matter. I just don't. I worked at an organization that was accused of being the number one conspiracy theory Illuminati organization in the world. And I can tell you, that's absolutely not what goes on in the World Economic Forum. It's well, the not. reality is always a little more mundane. Than <laughs> that's right. That's right. And also, Never assigned like, a conspiracy, you can assign it. You know, exactly. the idea that the yeah. government. No, I, I don't want to interrupt your train of thought because this is a great. Yeah. Point. The idea that like the government is like so organized that they're like. Organized. That's exactly right. 
that this, you know, this like, take down and it's all being keep kept under wraps and there's 20 different organizations that's, and no one's leaking it i mean so exactly. you know I, I, it seems I, like imp imp improbable but yeah go sorry. Right. So yeah. i was i was war i was told by someone when i when i was thinking about whether or not i, I wanted to take this role as ceo and i'd be engaging in washington you know like people like to think that washington is house of cards washington is actually veep <laughs> That's what it is, right? And I can confirm that that is true. And completely, like, like the, you know, the, the optimists yeah. want it to be West Wing. The pessimists. Want that's it to right. Be you know, House of Cards, but the reality. That's right. The reality is, it's actually me, right? Like that's and that's just true. People have a million things on their minds. I mean, all of these folks have ten thousand things they're doing every single day, and the idea that they're pulling back and their number one priority is like taking out and it's just it's just a little bit like huh, i don't know about that right especially because that don't forget this industry was not particularly politicized right it wasn't a political it wasn't like because operation choke point which everyone loves to talk about that was an operation and you know i i was not paying attention to this kind of thing at the time but going back and doing the forensics on it it was about guns primarily right and tobacco those are highly political activities very very political and they have been for an extreme i mean their party platforms about that right no one's party platinum. People weren't running on like crypto or not crypto. That's just not really a thing that was going on. It was not political to the board. We started our conversation. There was support on both sides of the aisle for this activity. So the idea that there's this concerted effort and this big conspiracy, I find a little bit, you know, yeah. silly. Now, I think, however, that when most people say operation, they don't mean necessarily this house of cards, you know, long-standing, well-structured, organized. I think they mean a little bit more about what your second option was, which is we don't like this thing. Here's a chance to get rid of it and get in there and try to make it smaller or offshore it or whatever. Yeah. I do think that idea has some merit because I think some of those naysayers, to your point earlier, you know, did did aren't going to let a crisis go to waste and took advantage of this um, of this moment in time. And so that I can see, but I think it's more complicated than that. I think there's also those straight straight up reality that when you look at banks and how banks think about banking activity, what it, what motivates a bank. Somewhat rhetorical, okay. Oh, but, so I, mean, I, I can answer, but I thought that was rhetorical. Well, no, it was somewhat rhetorical. I mean, well, like, why do you go ahead? I mean, you, you know, it motivates a bank. Yeah, so yeah. get enough to get deposits and earn a positive net interest margin, and make money, and go home and sleep well at night. Probably. Correct. Okay, there it is. Boom. Oh, right. So oh, that's what motivates God. a bank, right? So banks are going to take in their their other motivation is they don't want to have to meddle and mess with a ton of over supervision. They want to like keep that as clean and easy as possible also, right? They want a variety of customers. They want some diversification. They want to have safe and secure deposits. All of this is kind of what motivates a bank, okay? So if banks are feeling like there's they're jittery or nervous about the crypto industry, they themselves are going to take on some extra analysis or engagement and thinking about, is this a company? Is this an industry that I feel comfortable banking? Is this going to add more headache to my, you know, my operations or whatever it is? If there's that too. So there's a there's a push and pull kind of function. There's also this idea that a lot of crypto companies are starting to offshore. And I want to use that term specifically. When I say offshore, I don't necessarily mean leaving the US. I mean starting to think and be pragmatic about the options in other places. So you've already seen, you know, Gemini opening up in Singapore, getting licensed, Coinbase and Bermuda. You know, folks are looking around, but it's telling, right? They're not going to like my backyard, you know, shoddy fly by night jurisdiction land. They're going to like highly regulated environments. Bermuda yeah. is the insurance and reinsurance regulatory capital of the world, right? That is a highly regulated industry. The scheme in Bermuda for regulation is not light. Singapore, it's not light. These are pretty robust, you know, regulatory environments, right? And that's where some of these major companies are choosing to kind of look and locate and, you know, all these kinds of things in addition to the United States. So I just think it's really important to recognize that like any industry, there are actors who are really responsible, who want to do the right thing, who want, who are who welcome regulation. They understand that regulation is the next catalyst for growth of an industry. At some point, the legitimacy really matters. And there are others who are trying to arbitrage regulation and get to places that you know they don't want to be. Banks can't always tell the difference. They can't always tell the difference. So there is a little bit, I think, of that happening too, where banks themselves are very jittery and skittish after the failure of some pretty major banks. I mean, SVB, you know, First Republic, these are not like tiny little, you know, mom and pop banks that are just serving like one little town, right? These are yeah. pretty large regional players. And the fact that they are having these problems and challenges makes everyone nervous. And if there's enough rhetoric out there from some of these, you know, crypto enemies, as we want to call them that, right? Those who are trying to kind of see this industry go somewhere else, that crypto is to blame, they're going to, they're going to be nervous about that. So a lot of this is like, you know, um, 
sometimes where there's smoke, there's fire. Sometimes where there's smoke, there's just, you know, a candle, right? And it just, sure. you don't always know the difference. And sometimes you don't know how to look and tell the difference yeah. right away. So this is a great segue into the last sort of s- s- series of questions that I have, which is, um, and first maybe to clarify for the, for the audience, um, are you primarily American focused as an organization? Great question. So for the last six months or so, we have been. But okay. we do a lot of engagement in Europe, and we have from the very beginning of the organ, well, since I started as CEO, um, and we've been doing a lot of engagement with Singapore and Hong Kong, um, and now we're getting a little more involved in the Gulf as well and in the UK. Okay, because so, ultimately, like you're, you know, the the org- the industry that you represent is, as to as you pointed out, um, becoming global partly right. as for business reasons, but also out of out of necessity because maybe they find that there are. The, the opportunities are not as rich here in the U.S. as they were because of the regulations. So that that sort of, to me, is like the most important question of all of this, which is right now, the value of all crypto assets is, you know, a trillion dollars. And um, this is an industry that employs a lot of people, but it's not systemically important today, or it's not, you know, a huge driver of, say, you know, grow, economic growth. But if 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 things play out the way you and I think that they will, it will be at some, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, if this is the next era of the internet, then it's going to have mm-hmm. as big an impact as previous eras, if not a bigger impact. So is the U.S. falling behind uh, here with this um, sort of change yeah. of tone? Now, now, I know that you've pointed out that there are, are people who support it and maybe that just loud voices have gotten louder, but there does seem to be this feeling, you know, Europe, we saw the passage of the MICA law. Um, we've seen Hong Kong and even mainland China opening up um, and, you know, these other smaller jurisdictions like Singapore and the UAE, uh, yeah. who historically have, you know, looked for ways to, to attract expat talent and, uh, and business formation, taking all these steps as well. So like, what is the big geopolitical, you know, big picture? I wouldn't ask most people this, but you've got to, I know you have a view on this. I'd love to hear it. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I would have hedged uh, a few months ago even and said, well, it's complicated. Now I'm like, yes, I think the answer is yes. The U.S. is falling behind. Period, full stop. Yes. Uh, And the reason for that is that, you know, people are like, oh man, Europe moves so fast and look at Hong Kong doing all this thing, you know, 2020. That's because those folks were paying attention back during the ICO bubble, right? Mika started back then. I mean, it's not like Europe just suddenly snapped its fingers and had comprehensive regulation. That's been going on for five or six years, as you, you know, you well know. Yeah. And I've been talking to folks about this since I took the job at the forum. So in 2017, so uh, Bermuda, you know, announced its scheme in 2018, right? We did a whole session in Davos in 2019 where the premier, David Burt, explained what he was thinking yeah. in terms of regulations. I mean, that's like how many years ago, right? So the fact that the U.S. is finally waking up to this means we are just, we're so far behind, we're so far behind. Now, I always maintain you know, that, that you, you there is a danger to premature regulation, okay? Like regulating something too fast, you know, then you're cutting off innovation, you're closing the aperture, you're boxing it into something that really isn't isn't accurate. Yeah. I actually think that that the Europeans did a phenomenal job of, you know, there's some challenges with the with the regulations, but for the most part, that framework is really quite thought, it's very thoughtful, and it really kind of puts out uh, a wider aperture of innovation says there's some things that we just don't really understand yet. DeFi, NFTs, right? Those are just too new for us. To but other things have been around for long enough that, yeah, there's got to be some rules of the road. And I think that was a really healthy distinction. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's happened in some other places as well. The U.S. could move more quickly. But again, we have the politics of the situation that we're in right now. So we're not in an environment where legislation can move fast. And we're in an environment where because there's a scramble to catch up and to play catch up, the danger is the regulations that come out are going to be not fit for purpose, make no sense, you know, um, and push us even further behind the, us in the United States. So yes, the U.S. is undoubtedly definitely behind. Um, and will they catch up? Will we catch? I have no idea. And we're behind on multiple axes, right? So the other thing we haven't talked about, Alex, is the the advent of digital currency um, from a central bank, right? Like digital fiat, CBDCs. Yeah. So you've got, it's not just China, everyone knows about the digital yuan, but there are other, I mean, Christine Lagarde announced last May in Davos that she was going to, they were going to look into a digital euro. And she announced a four-year time frame for that. I personally think it's very optimistic, but you know, hey, right? Like the fact is there's a roadmap for that and activity is happening. Um, there's a lot of that going on. And, and, and the thing I always say that I'm sure you'll agree with is that once people engage with programmable money, everyone's going to want programmable money. Like that's, yeah. they're going to be like, oh my God, you know, it's kind of like, once you, I don't know, once you, you know, use a smartphone, you don't go back to like not using a smartphone unless you're a Luddite, right? You're just, it's just, you don't unring the bell. 
Yeah. And the thing I think that's being missed is what digital currency actually means. And leaving aside Web3 and all of that, which I think is also really powerful, but that's more of a business model architecture, I think, and a technology architecture. But from a consumer interface, programmable money is pretty powerful stuff. You know, and the fact that you can code certain kinds of things into money is, is really remarkable. And as that starts to really take off and that concept takes off, if you don't have that ability, you're just you're just so behind. So yeah. this is why I say even something as basic as stablecoin legislation, which is, I mean, I feel like it's such a no-brainer. I'm not sure it's going to get through this Congress because of the politics, not because people don't understand it or because it's complicated. I mean, obviously everything's complicated or because it's not important or because there isn't support for a stablecoin bill because the politics are just so, so, so fraught right now. And that, again, has nothing to do with crypto. That is about the nature of what's happening in American politics, which is a much bigger conversation, you know, than um, anything that would narrowly focus on, on this topic today. The emergence of these other centers of excellence or the, you know, the fact that the U.S. is falling behind, to me, strikes, hits at two like big macro trends. One is on technology. So you, you pointed out the different ways that you can think about this, but let's talk about business model architecture in Web3. Okay, so the through the first and second era of the web, the U.S. was the dominant force in the world, and partly that's because the internet began as a Department of Defense project. Um, the most of the internet connections in the world in the '90s were in the United States. The whole VC industry was there, the tech industry was there, and the rest of the world had to play catch up, right? Um, and this time, it's very different. Technology, tools, talent capital is way more distributed than it was. We're not in a single superpower world anymore either. There's a lot more different kind of nodes and spheres of influence, right? And so like, there's a risk that the, the government, the, or that the, it's not the government, it's the whole country as a whole. The economy like loses out to other areas. But then the other component of this is the actual money question, which is about the US dollar itself. Now, notwithstanding the fact that the US dollar is still dominant in the world, and uh, even in the past year, as things have kind of gone sideways, the U.S. dollar has actually outperformed most other currencies. There is a view that over time, the U.S. dollar maybe loses its influence as the as the global reserve currency, and that some of these innovations like digital currencies could kind of hasten that process, right? So I just find this whole discussion really interesting. You know, I think that we're talking about kind of ticky-tack issues in the U.S. when we should be thinking about I don't mean we, you and I and others in the industry. I mean at the at the at the government level when we should be thinking big picture about like what is the how does this tool set help long term? And I'm actually Canadian, and I live in Toronto, so I'm not speaking as an American. Um, and I think Canada has its own role to play in all of this. But I think if I were an American, I would be want I would be asking those questions, not um, not the other questions that are being asked, basically. Yeah, well, I am an American, and I can tell you that's exactly the conversation that I that I am trying to have, and that yeah. I do have with a lot of you know, not just policymakers, but even industry actors as well. You know, um, it, it is it a little bit you know sometimes you feel a bit like a Cassandra, you know, kind of like painting this you know this picture of the world that maybe people listen to or don't listen to. But I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think that there is a lot of uh, I don't know if it's denial and naivete. I don't know what it is, but on the part of Americans generally, um, this idea that American exceptionalism is uh, you know, a thing that is going to persist regardless is, uh, I think, I've never felt that that was a, a truism. And, and I think that you know people don't really like to hear that. But, you know. Well, outside uh, of the U.S. don't really like to hear that. Americans, I should say, don't really like to hear that. <laughs> you know. But I think the pandemic made things worse. I think, I honestly think that the pandemic and having people really uh, stuck in a bubble in their, in their communities and their countries and not traveling and not, you know, being out and not those kinds of things in some ways made things tougher and harder. And even as I think culturally, we've gotten more global. I mean, just the sort of like, you look at Netflix and the number of like number one blockbuster streamers from, you know, outside the US, like, you know, whatever it is, the dominance of Korea and the Korean media and the entertainment, you know, there's some of that happening, but the politics of it, I think have gotten, have gotten more challenging and tougher. And so the idea that, you know, that the dollar is the world's global reserve currency if you even question that, there are folks who immediately just discount, you know, anything else you say, um, because they cannot conceive of a world in which the U.S. dollar is not the world's global reserve currency. And there are obviously some power moves that can be made by the Fed and others, you know, to retain that position. But the thing about sanctions and the thing about dollarization is that folks have to want it. They have to want dollars. They have to want. They have to believe in the power of the U.S. government to stand behind sanctions. You know, all of that is complicated, right? And it and it's and it's 
more perilous and more fragile than I think a lot of people understand or want to believe. And when I look at the moves that, you know, China's making, right, that there's, I don't, I wouldn't call it an alliance with Russia, but certainly friendliness. When you look at Chinese engagement all over the global South, um, the fact that they have a system of programmable money that can make things seamless and frictionless and really provide investment, but the investment that's happening is not coming really from the U.S. anymore. It's, it, it, if it's in the form of foreign aid, that's now got a lot of strings attached to it more than it used to. I think that, you know, it, it, it's, it is not crazy to me, having been in a lot of those parts of the world, it's not crazy to me to imagine that folks, as they face more, you know, refugee crisis, climate crisis, drought, famine, you know, that they would be willing to take another form of currency and make it legal tender and do whatever with it, particularly if it's got yeah. this characteristic, this programmability that is really novel um, and that resonates with, you know, with their with their citizens. So I don't think that's as crazy as I think some of the American government would like to think. Um, but, you know, I, I, I but I also understand that, you know, there are a lot of moves between here and there and that's not an inevitable outcome. Um, but I do think I, I do certainly think that encouraging tech talent or, you know, passively like not discouraging, you know, some of this talent to offshore does not put the United States or keep it in this pole position that I think the United States likes to think that it, you know, is going to retain no matter what. So there we are. Yeah. Well, you know, if there's one, it's uh, like, you know, the, the end of history, like Francis Fukuyama. And, and I think people kind of get that that wrong. But. Um, you know, I think that it was Margaret Thatcher said in the, it, after that book that, you know, um, like never, never, dis, never, um, you know, count history out, like history fights back with yeah. vengeance. So, you know, like this idea that we have this U.S. dollar hegemony, um, you know, th these systems change all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. maybe it's not every, maybe it's not every five years, but it's every 50 to 100 years. Like it actually happens a lot. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where that you do have to remain vigilant, I think. And I, and I hope that in the US, government leaders um, do come to their senses. And I do hope that uh, though the temperatures kind of drop and that we have a more honest and sober discussion about this. And I think I'm very grateful, and I, I think I speak on behalf of a lot of people, that we have folks like you who are in the US and, and now apparently in other parts of the world, um, you know, advocating for the industry in a, in a really like thoughtful, sensible, clear-minded way. Uh, and I thought that was a really great way to end this discussion as well. So, Sheila, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Alex, for having me. All right, that concludes today's episode of DeFi Decoded. I am Alex Tapscott. See you next week. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer or solicitation by anyone in the United States or in any other jurisdiction in which such an offer or solicitation is not authorized or to any person to whom it is unlawful to make such an offer or solicitation. Prospective investors who are not residents in Canada should contact their financial advisor to determine whether securities of the funds may be lawfully sold in their jurisdiction. 